Welcome to the program. My guest is the former Red Wiggle, Murray Cook. Murray grew up in regional New South Wales and was deeply inspired by recording stars of the early 1970s. The self-professed music nerd learned guitar, joined bands and began a career as an early childhood teacher before teaming up to form the children's music group The Wiggles. The Wiggles have been an international musical force for nearly three decades with a fan base in the millions. Murray left the group in 2012, admitting he struggled for a time. But he's on a firm footing with his new band, The Soul Movers, and their new album, Bonafide, has just been released. Murray Cook, welcome to One Plus One. It's good to see you. Thank you too, Jane. Murray, it's been seven years since you took off the Red Skivvy, but you're still involved in the business. Is that a kind of strange place to be, like with one foot in, one foot out? Uh, it can be, but um, it's kind of nice to, to dip back into it. Um, you know, a lot of the time, just day to day, I, I don't have that much to do with the Wiggles, but it's really lovely to know that it's going on with the new line up and that it's so successful and, and children lo are loving it. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy that I'm still involved in some way. Did you have to get your house repainted when you left, you know, get rid of all the primary colours? <laughs> it's a little bit like that. Although someone was saying today, oh, you're wearing Jeff's colour. <laughs> I said I might fall asleep on camera. We'll see. <laughs> Hope not. No, I don't think so. So you were born in 1960. You grew up in Cowra. I think you've got a couple of siblings. Yes. And uh, your dad was a policeman. Yeah. What do you remember of your early life? We had a lot of freedom growing up, like as a lot of children did in the 60s, and in the country town as well. So, you know, we were the classic, during the holidays, we were the classic, uh, you know, mum would wave goodbye to us and we'd come back at, at you know, five o'clock at night or, you know, back for dinner. Um, Dad was always really busy. He was a detective. He was the only detective in Cowra, which meant he had to go to, you know, fatal car accidents or any sort of serious crimes. I remember that, but but I always felt he was around. I always felt he was very accessible um, to us kids, and uh, we were a pretty close knit family. I wonder, did your dad's job give you a sense of safety or danger? Did he bring his work home? He did up to a point, but his dad's a really positive kind of person who. Um, uh, doesn't really worry about things too much and, and he, I think he instilled a kind of optimism in me uh, and probably my, my uh, brother and sister as well. Um, we never felt that the world was unsafe, it, it didn't feel like that and d Dad, um, he, I'll probably get into trouble for telling him this, I oh, know he's, he's long retired, but he, um, he used to not carry his gun, he used to put it in the safe at work and, and um, because he didn't feel he needed it. So there was ne I didn't kind of think he was in any sort of danger. And did he have a kind of respect being the only detective in, in Cowra? Yeah, yeah. I remember in Cowra and in Orange, well, the big thing on a Saturday morning was everyone would go out to the shops and walk up and down the, the main street. And uh, I always knew with Dad that if um, someone said, G'day, Russ, that he was a friend. And if he said, G'day, Mr Cook, it was someone he'd locked <laughs> up. <laughs> So your early childhood would have been a great age for television and some of the music shows that came on in that time. I think there were the Monkeys, there would yes. have been Countdown a bit later on. Did those sorts of things influence you? Yeah, that was really my um, introduction to, to pop music or rock and roll music. Yeah, I just remember the monkeys just seemed so cool. You know, they all lived in the same house and they were funny. And then they, you know, in the show they'd play some songs and they had guitars. And that was the first time I think I really noticed guitars. And um, it was kind of the early beginnings of an obsession uh, that came later. And then I think uh, I was aware of the Beatles' name and I knew they were the guys that sang that the yeah, yeah, yeah song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what my mum referred to it as. And, uh, uh, and so I just, you know, I sought that, that kind of stuff out a little bit more and um, we didn't have a record player when I was young. We, um, Is that right? Yeah, and so I, I eventually nagged my mum to buy, buy us a record player, just a little portable one. So did your parents have 
expectations of you in the sense that, you know, did they want you to be a policeman or were you supposed to go to uni? What did they want? They were very big on education. They, um, they, they weren't particularly well ed educated themselves. Dad, Dad finished high school but Mum didn't. She went out to work when she was younger. Um, but they both, uh, especially Mum, loved to read. And so they really encouraged us to read and, um, you know, to do well at school. And, and uh, But I never really felt um, that I had to go into a specific um, career. Did you think that you were going to make your living in music when you first started playing in bands before university? Um, I hope to. It was an interesting time around the late 70s because um, the whole punk thing happened in, in the UK and, and that spilled over uh, to Australia and so suddenly there were all these bands who couldn't necessarily play all that well and uh, but the, but there was opportunities to actually play live all, all the pubs had bands you know some pubs had little new bands and some pubs had were bigger and had you know um, cold chisel and midnight oil and those sort of things but there, there was music around every night of the week you could go out and see see great bands and or, or terrible bands like the one I was in <laughs> um, but you know, we got better. But we got better because we played so much, yeah. and um, uh, and so yeah, there was. I think there actually was more opportunity in some ways to make a living from music in those days because there was so much work around um, live wise. We never cracked that, but uh, with the bands I was in. But um, I had a band called the Transistors, and then that kind of morphed into another one called the uh, Finger Guns, uh, with a great oh, a couple of mates from school, and uh, my friend Mark wrote songs, and and uh, we'd play them. So did you? Remember actually saying to yourself, you know, it's time to give the bands up to go and study early childhood education. I mean, was there a big pull towards that? Uh, I think it was just more a case of things just petered out. We released a couple of singles through through a major label, but the record deal sort of came to an end and we kind of went, well, we've, we've probably got about as far as we can go. Um, so we decided to knock it on the head. I was I was working in the public service at the time, which was a great job for a musician. You had flexi time, and um, you know it was quite flexible. And and I knew I didn't want to do that all my life. When I first left school, I started an arts degree, and I thought I'd teach high school. And then I had this sort of revelation. I went, Why would I want to teach high school? I think that'd be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd be teaching kids like us, you know. <laughs> um, and I always. Uh, really related to little little kids, um, you, you know. I found them really interesting. And, and this course, the early childhood course, is a bit different to um, other education uh, degrees. That in that you learn a lot more about child development. It's much more child centred. So if you do primary, you, you're much more teaching to a curriculum. Whereas um, in early childhood, you're developing the curriculum for individual children. And I love the kind of um, freedom of using the arts in, in education as well. So when did the tie-up with um, Anthony Field and Jeff Fat, who, who had been in The Cockroaches, when did that all come together? It was um, initially in, in uh, second year at university. Um, Anthony had already done the first year and then The Cockroaches um, had a big hit and so he, he deferred the rest of the course. So when he came back after he got sick of being on the road, um, he... Um, he ended up in the same year as me and even though I, did, I had, didn't know him before but I, of course I knew who he was and, and we had a lot of mutual friends and, um, and we played a lot of the same venues so we really sort of were, were fairly like-minded people and, um, and he knew Greg um, who was quite a bit younger than us. Greg Page. Greg Page and because um, Greg was a big Cockroaches fan and, and um, had actually roadied for them and, and he, you know he, uh, Anthony convinced him that the early childhood course would be good for him as well. So he started a few years be, um, behind us. And then Jeff we got in because he, he was in the Cockroaches and uh, um, Anthony wanted him to come and just play some keyboards on something. Jeff said, oh, how long is it going to take? And he said, oh, a few hours. And 20-something you know, years later, he was still there. <laughs> jumps, fine, fine. So jumps, this was jumps. actually a conscious decision to get together to play music. For kids. Yeah, well, we'd done it. Well, we actually recorded the first album just after Anthony and I finished university. We were already out teaching. Um, and we'd played a lot of music while we were at university for children. And we used to go busking uh, at Circular Quay with Anthony's brother, uh, John, as well. And that was great fun. And we used to make a fair bit of money too, which was good when you're a student. Uh, but it was really Anthony's idea then let's record an album of music for children. Um, 
because we felt that we could do better than what a lot of what was out there um, because we knew a lot about you know the way children think and about using music for children and how to make it really tailored for them. This song's about a man who lived a long, long time ago. And you know but we took elements from Play School as well because we knew how Uncle good that was. And um, yeah, but it was a, it was only ever we only ever really thought of it as a hobby. We were just doing one album and um, and then. Um, uh, Jeremy Fabini, who was ma manager of the Cockroaches, took it to the ABC for us, and um, and they they signed us up. and And uh, for the first couple of years, we we were still teaching, um, but then the the album started selling more and more, and we'd do some more shows, and they'd be, more people would come, and um, it, and then we decided let's let's throw our, our jobs in for a year and see how it goes. And uh, we thought, yeah, you know, at the end of that year, we'll have a meeting and. Have a chat about it. We never had that meeting because it was quite <laughs> clear it was it was something that was going to continue at least for a few years. Get ready to wiggle. We've been ready for so long. Get ready. It sounds like, particularly in the beginning, that it was just an awful lot of fun. I think you described somewhere it was like you know your hobby that yeah. just kind of went out of control. Yeah, absolutely, in some it was. Ways. Yeah. So when it's often when people say, "Oh, you know," it was. That was a great marketing idea or something like that. Like we didn't have much clue about that kind of stuff. We just did something that we thought was good for children and that we loved doing ourselves. And, you know, they're just such a refreshing audience as well, the, the child audience. And if you can engage them, which is what we, we did, um, they, they'll stay with you and they, you know, and they have a great time and you have a great time. I've always been interested in how performers, even musicians, kind of get their persona for on stage. Mm. And I think a lovely representation of both your Wiggles persona and uh, your musician persona came out recently in the DZ Death Ray video that you did, I think, which, which was called Like People. Yes, yeah. And it was hilarious seeing you switch, you know, to the over the top sort of Wiggles persona that yes. you used to be. Was that something that came naturally? You know, because I guess you all had to develop some aspect of yourselves that was larger than life for performance. Yeah, the, the personas in the Wiggles are pretty much who we are, but yeah, as you say, it's, larger than life, yeah. just, you know, uh, exaggerated. So, um, you know, Jeff, for instance, is, is the, um, the most laid back guy you'll ever know. He's, um, just so easy going and, and um, you know, just lets life come to him in a lot of ways. And so the kind of sleeping, well, the sleepiness came from two things. It was partly that because he's so <laughs> laid back, but it was also because he didn't have um, early childhood training. He wasn't as used to talking to children as we were. Oh, no. Jeff's fallen asleep and we need Jeff to help. It, it was a way of getting him involved in the performance without him ha having to sort of come up with no something to say. And it gave the children power over him, which children love having power over an adult. They're the ones who wake him up, not us. And he became the most beloved of, of the four of us, really, because of that. One, two, three. Was there ever any feeling between the four of you that, oh, you know, Anthony's getting too much airtime or Greg's getting too much airtime or, you know, I need more time in the big red car. I mean, what was, <laughs> what was the sort of, I suppose, the, the relationship between the four of you like? We're all really good at deflating each other's egos. You always knew that if you did, if you got bit too big for your boots, the others would drag you down. Or well, not drag you down, that sounds terrible, but, you know, uh, stick a pin in the balloon. Um, so, but we never really had to do it, I don't think it was... Um, and, and I think a lot of that is to do, if you're performing for adults, um, there's kind of adulation from people um, your, your own age or your, your peers in a way. With, with children, it's all about them. We, we were very child-centred. It was all about um, what's in it for the child, not what's in it for us. And I think that kept, kept us pretty grounded as well, even when we were you know, playing Madison Square Garden or, or um, you know, in the Macy's Parade at, in going down Broadway, we weren't kind of going, oh, look at us, aren't we great? It was more like, well, how did we get here? I'm interested that you said Madison Square Garden because I know you played in New York uh, soon after 9-11. Mm. Did you sense a sort of change in the tone being there? Um, yeah, it was much more sombre, I think, when we, we, we went and performed there in the November. We just really felt for those people. We had a really um, quite close relationship with New York. New York was kind of the first place where we had success in America, where um, even before, you know, we were on the Disney Channel, um, which came a little later, we already had an audience in New York and, and, uh, and we had, a, we noticed in the Thanksgiving Day Parade that there was, that all the police knew who we were, because nearly all the police we were quite young and had young kids and and 
you know, even when people in the crowd were going, what's a wiggle? The police were going, oh, it's Murray, it's, it's, it's Jeff, you know, which was, yeah, that was really sweet. cool. Yeah, very sweet. So the Wiggles went for 21 years. I read somewhere that it was pretty much touring for 10 months of the year. I think there were some 7,000 shows. Even when you love something, that must have become quite grinding in the end. Yeah, it did. And the hardest part was being away from our families. Um, you know, we all had, well, three of us had children and... Um, We'd, we'd always try to work it so that we had time at home. So we, when we went to the States, we'd usually go for six or seven weeks, then come home and we'd have a week off. Um, so that worked okay. I mean, a lot of bands would tour and they'd just go what, for months. You know, it's quite exciting touring the States for the first, you know, five or six, seven, eight, ten times. Um, but, you know, when you're in some of the little towns where there's not much happening, it's not quite as um, glamorous as people might think. Um, and yeah, towards the, in 2012, um, Jeff was having some health issues. His back was hurting. He, he had some problems with his heart. He had a pacemaker installed, and um, he was kind of. It was clear he was coming to the end of wanting to do it. And uh, and I, you know, because I was, I had young. Or they were still fairly young. My family, um, they were in their teens. I just thought, well, if Jeff's going, I might as well go too. And um, it was a, it was a very hard decision, and it was really hard after um, for for the first year or so. I I second guessed myself a lot. I was I just thought, oh, I think I made the wrong decision. Um, you know, I missed it. And um, uh, and I was talking to Lindy Morrison from the Go Betweens, and when the Go Betweens broke up. Um, she said she really struggled with it and she said it took her about 10 years to get over it. Really? Yeah. So it, when it's something's your life when, and it's been your life for so long, I, I mean, it's not the only part of my life, obviously, because I had family and friends, but it's such a big part of your life to suddenly not have it there anymore, um, even if it is the right decision, is quite a shock to the system. And I was pretty lost there for a, a year or probably two years. Um, and um, so I think that's why just the music that I'm making now has kind of been the, the big game changer for me. Before we move on to the mm. music that you're making now, I must ask you, your daughter is a, a national wheelchair basketball player. Mm. You, you have a son, you have a wife. What was the effect on the family, given that you were away from home so much? Um, it's, it was tough, you know. Um, uh, it was tough on my wife especially because so much went when the children were younger because they were... When the Wiggles started, they weren't born. So they, they were born during the time of the Wiggles. Um, and, yeah, it was hard. And I, I, I know my son resented me being away at, at times. And, um, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, when it's not two parents there all the time. And it was hard for me because I really missed them. But it's also hard to, to be out on the road and, and um, doing what you do and then to come back and... Um, you know, um, have to change nappies or, um, you know... Uh, Be normal yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it was harder for them than me, obviously. Yeah. So you came back. You say very honestly that you struggled for a year. What did you do with yourself in that time? Um, well, I was still playing some music. There was... I had... Um, uh, I had a cover band called Bang Shang Alang that used to play quite often. That was really good. And that was actually with, with Mark, who was the singer in, in my bands in the 80s. And then I kind of just said yes to nearly everything. If people wanted me to come and speak somewhere or, um, you know, like I've, I've spoken a couple of times at um, Macquarie University graduations, I would just kind of do everything because I was thinking, what, what, what will I do? I was too young to, mm. to actually retire. We, we framed it as retiring from the Wiggles, but it didn't mean I was retiring and going and playing golf or something. I don't do that. Um, so, yeah, I really had to find what am I going to do with the rest of my life. And so when, for example, you appeared at Splendour, uh, that was in 2018, mm. you had an incredible audience. I think you played ACDC, Highway to Hell, and for many people perhaps it was a bit of a shock to see you with all the hair. You know, you were kind of like Murray Wiggle grown up in a sense, but the audience too were people who'd grown up with the Wiggles and here they were seeing you in a very different vein. How did that all come together for you as you were playing? Uh, I've done some really 
amazing things in my life. That's probably one of it's really up there in the it's certainly in the top five of um, just mind blowing. I, I knew there would be a reaction when I went out because um, I knew the reaction to the the, the light people video, the, the DZ um, video, which is how I kind of got involved with them in the first place. And and um, and yeah, when they asked me to come up and do Splendor, I, I thought, oh, that, that'd be fun. And I think Shane, the, who is the singer, just said, um, you know, please welcome Murray Wiggle. And I walked out and I had my, you know, Gibson SG guitar and I was looking pretty rock and roll, I, I thought. And uh, <laughs> Uh, I knew there'd be a reaction, but um, when I went out, I was, I was really blown away. They just, the huge roar was, was just phenomenal. It was a really lovely reaction too, because it was, it was really warm. It wasn't, and, and I could see the faces, they were so excited. And, and I heard later that friends were um, ringing their other friends saying, you've got to come over to the main stage, Murray's on stage with, with TC Death Rays. And, um, and it, yeah, it was the first day, first day of the festival, and I think tri uh, Triple J might have said, posted something and said, uh, the the the, um, the most Aussie moment ever has already happened at, at uh, Splendour. Your new album with the Soul Movers, um, Bonafide. Mm. You guys went to some of the key recording studios in the states and even played with some of the famous people who've played with great recording stars over the years. What's it like to step into, in a sense, someone else's workspace? It's quite daunting at first. Um, uh, we, we were in the States a couple of years ago and we visited the studios, uh, two of the studios, Fame and Muscle Shoals Sounds, um, just to have a look at them. And, uh, and we met Dan Auerbach, who's from the Black Keys, who are quite famous, but the drummer he was using it was this man, man in his 70s who that's who we started talking to and um he's a guy called gene chrisman who played on dusty in memphis and um uh, suspicious minds and kentucky rain and in the ghetto for elvis and and it was funny too because he said oh i know the wiggles but yeah he had grandchildren and so uh, that was that was quite a thrill and then so he took us into the studio and we looked around and it was like pretty mind-blowing just doing that so with the, the seeds were sown then for us to go back, I think Dan Auerbach said, are you coming here to record? And I said, oh, we weren't planning to, but that's a good idea. And, uh, and so we did, we started planning and, and uh, in August last year, we went back. Oh, yeah. we it's one of those things that is quite daunting at first. It can be overwhelming. You have to be careful not to be too overwhelmed by it, especially being the music nerd I am. I mean, these studios are fame studios. Aretha Franklin recorded her first number one hit there, um, Never Loved a Man. Wilson Pickett did, um, Land of a Thousand Dancers, uh, Mustang Sally, Hey Jude. Uh, yeah, so these are serious, and some of these guys that we played with played on those records, which is, um, yeah, that, that can be kind of a bit overwhelming. But once you get past that, it just becomes another workspace. It becomes a, um, like a wonderful workspace, but you, you just get down to the work and the recording and playing. I can feel your excitement. Oh, so I'm still, in some ways, I'm more excited now when I look back and think, wow, did we really do that? That was so, so amazing. So I saw a video clip of one of your recent songs, or the Soul Movers numbers, and, you know, again, maybe you're there up on stage, but you look content. Are you? I am. I really am. This is um, doing this music. And it's, it's a real creative outlet for me too. I'm not playing in someone else's band, which I do enjoy. Um, playing in other people's bands, but it's it, this is kind of my band. It's uh, Lizzie and I write most of the songs. She's, she, I always say I'm the junior partner. She does the lion's share of it, but um, but I have a real creative outlet. I feel like this is something that I I own and I haven't felt like that since the Wiggles. Um, and so I'm just really enjoying it. And we don't have, and in some ways it's like the start of the Wiggles. We, we're not, we're not trying to be rock stars. We're just, we just love doing it. And, um, you know, by doing, uh, publicity and things like that just means if we can get a bit more popular, we can keep doing it. If we have an audience, we can keep doing it for as long as we want. Many people would look at you and say you've had a charmed life. You've had at least one great career and another one that's in development now. You've made a lot of money. You've made a lot of people happy. I wonder, do you see it that way as well? Anthony and I were always really great at, at, um, at being aware of how amazing our experiences were. You know, we, we never took anything for granted. We never expected that there would 
you know, the next run of shows would be full houses. You know, we just always thought this could end at any time. You, you know, it's the entertainment business. Anything could happen. Um, I feel like I am very um, fortunate. Um, you know, I've, I was in the right place at the right time um, with the Wiggles. We, we came up with something that um, captured the imagination of the, you know, the nation's children and then later several nations' children. And, um, you know, the, some of that is just luck. It's just the, you get together and there's a the chemistry with people and, and, you know, you come up with something. But, you know, we always had our heart in the right place. We always had our brains in the right place too. I think we always thought, um, you know, this has to be about the children, not about us. And I think that's why it, why it worked. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I have had a charm life in some ways, but, you know, we worked really hard. And I think think that, you know, that I got that from my parents, that sort of work ethic. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with the way things went. Murray, do you have any regrets? Um, not really, other than um, I, I wish I'd been better at, um, at the, the work-life balance. Um, I, I wish when my children were younger I had, had a bit more time with them. But then, you know, I see other friends, I talk to other friends who you know, work in a fairly high-powered uh, you know, day, weekday job and, um, you know, some of them never knew their kids' teachers because they were never around when the kids were going to school. Um, you know, they didn't see that part of their ch child's life. So I feel fortunate in that, in that sense that even though I was away a lot, when I was home, if I was home for a week or two weeks, I was... I was there, I, you know, I'd take them to school, I'd, you know, do all those things and, and um, uh, but yeah, I think, I, I'm, I am sorry, I, I miss certain milestones, I guess. If you were going to finish a show and you had the choice of a song to end a show on, what would that song have been? I'll, I'll answer that two ways. There's a song actually from the first Soul Movers album that I didn't play on. Um, called A Few Good Reasons and it, it, it's just, it's a great ender just because it's a great rocker and, and uh, you know, Lizzie has an amazingly powerful voice and you know, she just belts this out and I'm, I get to go crazy on the guitar. In the Wiggles, we'd um, quite often end with Hot Potato. Hot Potatoes, wow! Because um, it was just a great, exciting kind of thing and there was a real sort of sense of a thrill going through the audience when we said, you know, it's time for some Hot Potato. Hot Potato, Hot Potato, Hot Potato, Hot Potato. Murray Cook, thank you so much. Thanks, Jane. Potato, potato, potato. That was the musician Murray Cook. You can watch episodes on iView or our website. You can contact me on Twitter and Facebook. I'll be back here next time. See you then.